Exodus chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, uh, we encourage you always to follow in your own Bible if you can. We think that's helpful. We'll also have it up on the screen here so you don't miss it. But Exodus chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 21 through 27. And just to give you a little context for this, because we kind of jump into the middle of something uh, with our reading today. Uh, The context is that God's people, the Israelites, have been in Egypt for a long time, and over time they have become enslaved. They are used as slave labor. Uh, They are treated really, really harshly. Um, In many cases, uh, their children are sought to be murdered. Um, And uh, after a a period of time, God um, hears the cries of his people, and he is at work to deliver them. And he does that by bringing a series of plagues Uh, that he brings on the uh, Egyptians, trying to convince Pharaoh, king of the Egyptians, to let God's people go. And after nine of these plagues, which have been really severe, Pharaoh still is stubbornly saying no. And so God is about to bring a tenth plague, the most terrible of all the plagues, which is God is going to strike dead the firstborn son uh, of all in Egypt. And As God prepares to do this last plague to free his people, he gives instructions to Moses, and Moses now is going to tell the people of Israel what to do on this night called the Passover. This is from Exodus 12, follow along, verses 21 through 27. Remember, this is God's word. And then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families." and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. And when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over the door, that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And then the people bowed down and worshipped. Let's take a moment to pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence right here in this place. And so we know that as we read your word, Lord, um, that you would speak to us if we would be given ears to hear, if we would open our hearts and our minds. Help us to do that now. And by your power, God, would you feed us from your word so that we can go out and be changed by you. By your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, to just kind of look at this series as a whole again, our, our goal has been, my goal has been, to try to encourage you as parents or as grandparents, uh, whatever stage of life where you are working with children, to try to raise them, to know the Lord, to encourage you. And I know it felt a little bit awkward probably because I was calling out specific ways in which we mess up as parents and, and our failures in that way. But what we've tried to say is this is helpful if we can all just admit that, if we can all kind of get on the same page that there are no perfect parents, that we all recognize it's a pretty scary deal you have a child and the hospital will throw a couple diapers and wipes your way and say, good luck with all that, you know, and then you're, you're kind of set free and then you go and you're like, ah, we don't really know what we're doing, you know, and it's kind of day by day you're trying to figure, sort, sort things out and it's a struggle because, you know, they start out pretty helpless but then as they grow they change and just when you think you're starting to get the hang of it, you know, then they hit another stage of development and then they hate you and you're trying to figure out how did I raise this person who hates me and doesn't want anything to do with me and, and it's really, really, uh, it's a hard thing, it's a struggle. So I want to encourage you that parenting is, I think, the hardest job on the planet. But you're not alone and those of you who have put your faith in Christ, 
you have a hope of the gospel that's at work in you and through you, not only for your parenting, but also, and this goes again to everyone, whether you're a parent or not, the power of God, who is our good, good Father, who is our perfect Heavenly Father. And His parenting to us um, is perfect. It's never um, uh, without purpose, and it never misses the mark. And there's always hope so that God can take even our worst mistakes and sins and failures and overcome them. But more than that, the power of the gospel is such that God says, and I will change you. So you don't have to be in this despair that you're going to keep repeating the same old cyclical sins in our lives over and over and over again. That God really does, progressively, slowly, it seems to us, but it really does happen, change us. And so we learn and we grow from God's parenting of us. So this series is meant to do that, and the essence of this message today is basically this. We fail in lots of ways, but one of the ways that we fail as a parent is we fail to tell our kids that we fail. We fail to confess our failures. We fail to be open about where we have really messed up. And again, I want to expand this and extend this, not just to parents, but this is true of all of us, that one of the struggles that we have as individuals is that we work really, really hard to try to make ourselves look better than we are, that we want to hide the flaws and the imperfections and the sins. We want to hide that as best we can because we don't want our kids certainly to see that, we think, and we certainly don't want other people to see that. But what I want to say this morning is that God is actually freeing us to share those things. That God, in fact, wants to have his love so fill us that we are freed to not worry about our self-image. That we're freed to not always be trying to worry about what people will think about us or build ourselves up. But we're, we're actually so filled by his love, we can honestly say, I, I, I did that. Uh, that was my sin. I was wrong. And that freedom to confess. And so there's a, a verse in the Bible in the New Testament where in the uh, writing that James gives us that he says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. That there's a great healing that happens when we're able to be open and honest even about our faults and our failures and our sins. And I drew this text to look at it today um, from this perspective in Exodus. It seems like maybe an odd text to, to kind of dive into this, but... I want to begin by the, looking at the interaction that, go back to parents and children here for a second, that God builds between children and their parents that is absolutely essential for this to happen, that we're able to share our story of our life, even the messy parts, because God builds into children this natural inquisitiveness, this desire to know, this really kind of asking questions all the time. In fact, in the middle of God telling them the technical details of Passover. Hey, from years on down the line, you're going to remember this night. It's going to be a terrible night, but also a night of freedom where you're brought out of slavery. Remember, by doing this Passover meal with the blood over the doorpost and you've slaughtered this lamb, and now you eat it as part of a meal together as a family, but you will always remember that. But in the middle of all that, God says, so when you remember to do these things, your kids are going to start asking you questions. Your kids are going to ask you questions and puts it right in the text. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? What does this mean to you, Mom? What does this mean to you, Dad? Then tell them. In other words, God's saying, I, I build this into to kids right away. I saw this stat. I, it must be true. It's on the Internet. So anyway, I, I saw four-year-olds ask, on average, no kidding, 487 questions a day. 487 questions a day that a four-year-old asks. Some of you are like, that's low ball on it, Cliff. I think it's a little higher than that. And almost all of those 487 questions happen at the worst possible moments. Like, there's a question, but I would love to answer that, except that right now your brother is literally taking every box of cereal off of the shelf at the store, and I, I really can't answer your question right now. The questions come a lot of times at the worst possible moments for us as parents or grandparents, and you want to respond, but it feels like the, the hecticness or the rush of the day, the pressures and the stress really don't make it possible to get into it. 
And sometimes it's the nature of the question. So kids will ask these, you know, kind of deep questions. You know, what, what, why, why am I here? Where did I come from? You know, every parent wants to get into that question right away, right? Or why is the sky blue? You know, why do Hobby Lobbies exist? Why do those kinds of mysteries of life happen out there? And so you're like, how do I even begin to get into a question? So sometimes the nature of the question seems like, you know, I don't even know what to tell you. I've heard this um, from child development um, folks that say, you know, when a kid gets into that why stage, so even when you give an answer and they're like, yeah, but why? Uh, yeah, why? Why? I, I just told you why. Why? And you're like, you're just irritating me now. But what they're saying is that kids really aren't trying to say, I'm not impressed with your answer. You're going to have to do better than that. What they're really saying is, I just want more. I want you to tell me more. Because, see, I'm understanding the world and me and you and everything that I experience through you. You're the one who's guiding me, helping me to understand all this, and I, I, want, I want more information, and the, they don't know how to really put it that way, so they just keep saying, why? Tell me more. I, I, I read this kind of this neat thing. Mom getting this from her kids. I think he was three or four years old, and he was just, why, 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 why? Why is the sky blue? He, he asked her that question, and she said, I realized that he just wants to have a little story, a little conversation. So he, she said, well, you know, it's an interesting thing about the sky. She said, it is blue, like today, she said, but you know what? There are times earlier in the morning or later at night when the sky actually looks orange or red. And there are times when in the middle of the day it doesn't look blue, it looks kind of gray when there's a lot of clouds. And there are times at night when the sky is so dark it's black. Isn't it amazing the different colors that the sky can do? And the kid was like, this is fantastic. And some of you are like, yeah, but you skirted the question. You never answered the question, why is the sky blue? They want to know the story of your experience with it. That's why our text says, when your kid asks you about this ceremony, it's a religious ceremony, you're going to do it as a people year after year after year. And when they ask, they don't just ask, why do you do this? What does this mean? They ask, what does this mean to you, to you personally, Mom, to you, Dad, what's happening there? I think, again, part of the struggle is the time pressures. It's like, I'd love to have a conversation with my kid about that. But it's, it's really difficult to do, Cliff, because we've got to get supper ready, and we've got to run over here, and we've got all these activities that we've got to do, and we're trying to squeeze it in. I just read this, this new statistic just came out. And don't get me wrong, I'm not preaching against technology. I love technology. It's a good thing. It's not all a bad thing. But the screen time that kids under the age of 10, the amount of time that they spend in front of a screen, whether it's a mobile screen or some other device that they have, has gone up now to 2 hours and 19 minutes a day. And, and again, some of you are like, I think that's lowballing it. I, I think my kids are in front of screens more than that. Two hours and 19 minutes every day that they're in front of a screen of some kind. And of course, when they get older than 10, that goes up exponentially. I mean, teenagers have a really, really high rate of usage in their faces in front of a screen. It's interesting. Did you know who uses screen time most? Is not younger kids and it's not teenagers, it's parents. Did you know that parents have more screen time um, for them than they, they, even their own teenagers? I understand that, and it's not a bad thing. You've got to get something done. You put the kid in front of a, here, play this game on this video. But at some point, God is saying, don't miss this opportunity. I actually created your kid with a desire to ask a question to engage you. Among all the people on this planet, they want to come and ask you why. Why did this happen? Why is the sky blue? Well, just Google it. You'll get a better answer than I can give you, right? No, that's our opportunity, God says. So don't miss the opportunity. It's tremendous opportunity and responsibility. I get this too. The weight of this, because your kids believe what you say. It's amazing. I can't get people to believe anything I say, but a young, a young child growing up, what mom or dad says, is it's the truth. It's so true, in fact. Uh, these are weird websites, but... There's a website called IUSEDTOBELIEVE.COM, and it's actually all these adults who now are going back and saying, you know, my dad told me this, and now I just found out as an adult that it's not true. Things like, when I was little, my dad told me that polyester was a small animal in Australia. 
and they would kill it to make clothes. And so that night I sat in my room for hours reading the labels on my clothes and throwing out all of the polyester clothes that I had. Or another one says, when I was younger, my dad told me that if I whistled, it would attract snakes. <laughs> and so I can't even hear a whistle now without getting nervous, this person said. Or one who said, I overheard my dad, this sometimes come back against parents here, I overheard my dad use the word brothel. And I asked him what that was. And he hesitated, and then he told me it was another name for an amusement park. <laughs> and so a year or so later, we went to Florida as a family, and we got on a public shuttle bus, and when we passed Disney World, I shouted, Dad, look, Dad, a brothel. Can we please go? And so you realize, wow, they don't believe anything that you say. Of course, the, the power of this is that I don't want to give them wrong information. Notice these were all dads. I never got any moms that were giving <laughs> misinformation, only the dads. But at some point, you realize God has invested you with this power to be able to transfer the truth. And again, I know some of you are like, Cliff, I don't know, that's not my kids. My kids don't believe anything I say. They don't, they don't trust me. Don't misunderestimate or, misunder, or misestimate your, your, your power as an adult to do this because here's the thing. Studies still show. I know when they reach adolescence and teenager, you're thinking their peers matter way more to, to them than me. They, they don't care. They could give a rip about me as a parent. And studies still, still show the primary influencer in their life, even in the teenage years, is mom or dad. Still. They may not say it. They may not admit it. But their values are being shaped by you. What their beliefs are being shaped and formed by you. And God says, I did this on purpose. I gave this power, this opportunity and responsibility to you. Now, once you know that, then here comes a powerful opportunity to admit, not just to pass on information, the truth, but the truth about you and the truth about me. That we are able to then speak into the lives and admit that we are all sinners in need of God's grace. One of the things that happens with kids is that they begin to form their development, developmental wise, they look at parents as kind of a picture of God. You, you are God to them. And as they look at you, and they begin to strive to say, I want to please my parents, I want to please dad, I want to please mom, and the weight of that, you're like, wow, that, there's a lot of responsibility there, but at some point, to be able to differentiate for them that you are not God, that you are, in fact, someone that God has given to them, and you want to love them like God, but in the end, I fail to do that, son. I, I'm not up to that completely, daughter, because I am a sinner like you you and like everybody else. Isn't this why it's such tremendous damage when someone is abused by a parent? Because suddenly, and we have people who still struggle, of course, with if their father was abusive, and now as an adult, and they're fully aware, hey, dad was not God. He's not God at all. I understand that. And yet still can't bring themselves to say our heavenly father because the connotation of father is so wrapped up in the abuse that they receive that it's really, really hard. Doesn't it show that at some point it's incumbent on us as parents to say, I want to point you to God, but you've got to understand something. I am a sinner. I'm not God. Critically important that they begin to hear us say things. I, I, I hear some parents are really exasperated. You ever catch your kid doing something? And you catch them red-handed. I mean, it's not, it's not like you need much more evidence here. I mean, you got videotape, you got hands are red. I mean, everything is there. And they won't admit that they did it. Do you ever have that happen? You're just like, what, what is wrong with you? Everybody sees that it was you. You did this. And they will not admit it. And here's a question. How many times have they heard you admit that you were wrong? Because make no mistake, Kids watch us for a living. In other words, it doesn't matter what we say, but what we do. We've heard that over and over again. Hey, what you do is, makes more of an impact, but that means we have to model for them also, not only the right behavior, but when we mess up and we do it wrong, we have to model for them what it's like to come up and say, I was wrong. I, I did that. And to be able to model this for our kids is a powerful, powerful action, I think, in their life. 
the world will not give them many examples of that. They won't. You see it in the news all the time. Somebody's caught doing something, and it's just, I have no recollection of doing that. I, I didn't do that. And there's denial, denial, denial. Very rarely do we see somebody who steps up and just flat out says, I did it and I was wrong. And so our kids are needing some kind of example, and from mom and dad is a powerful thing. And I think we're afraid to do this for a number of different reasons. One reason is, I think we're afraid we're going to lose our moral high ground. Cliff, I'm trying to teach them wrong and right. If I tell them that I was wrong, that I sinned, am I, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna lose my ability to speak into their life about what is right or wrong because they'll say stuff like, well, you did it. If you did it, well, how are you telling me that it's wrong to do it? I think we're also afraid that we're gonna encourage our kids to actually make the same mistakes that we make. Cliff, if I tell them where I've messed up, isn't that going to pretty much encourage them just go ahead and do it because after all, I guess it turned out okay for you, so I'm going to go ahead and make the same mistake. I think we worry about that, and I think we also worry that somehow it's going to diminish our kids' respect for us. Like if I tell them I'm really messed up and I'm a sinner, and they hear that, that at some point they're going to start losing respect for me. Like they're going to say, wow, I know Pastor Cliff does this all the time, but you really are messed up, you know? Good luck with that, Mom, Dad. I mean, we're afraid we're going to lose. I just read this down in Oklahoma. A little town, Sperry, Oklahoma. I think it's north of Tulsa. A little town smaller than Beloit, just like 1,200 people. And the police chief of Sperry, Oklahoma, posted on the Facebook page for the police department, um, he wrote this. This was interesting. He said, uh, a citizen made a complaint about me, your police chief, speeding. And I acknowledge that I was wrong. I was traveling at about 75 miles per hour in a 50 mile per hour zone. I did have a reason for being in a hurry, but my speeds were not reasonable. And so I'm holding myself accountable just as anyone else would have to be. I've written myself a $300 citation and I'll be paying it just like every other citizen. I regret my actions, and I sincerely apologize. And then there was a TV station that heard of this and went, over to, went up to interview him. And they interviewed him, they found out that he confessed to it because someone had actually gotten video of him speeding, and they sent it in anonymously to the police department. And so the, the reporter asked the police chief, they said, well, it was really something that you would give yourself a, a ticket for this. Would you have given the ticket if they hadn't sent the video in? And he said, probably not, he said, probably not, to be honest. Now I wanna ask you something. Does your respect go up or down for somebody like that? I don't know, when I was reading, I was like, first that he gives himself a ticket, I thought, hey, that's a pretty upstanding guy. And then what really sealed it for me was that when he was asked, he could have said, oh no, I, I would have sent that in, I would have given myself a ticket no matter what, but he had the honesty to say, you know what, there's still a part of my heart that still would have tried to hide it. But I got caught, and now I'm not going to try to hide it anymore. I'm, I think your respect goes up. Your kids begin to look at you and say, they're not trying to use me. They're not trying to pretend they're better than they are. Mom and dad are able to share with me when they also mess up. By the way, let's get some balance here, okay? I'm not trying to say that your kids become your therapist. I'm not trying to say take your deepest, darkest secrets and dump it on your kids because it's a burden that they were not meant to carry. But I am talking about the kinds of ways in which we as parents, we catch them and we want to hold them accountable, but the slightest thing on our part, we want to excuse away. How different would it be for our kids when we say, hey, I just want to tell you something. I was too harsh with you. I came home, I was kind of frustrated from work, I was, and, and when I had to discipline you, I'm going to tell you, I had more than just loving discipline. I had a lot of anger in there, and I went over the top, and I'm sorry for that. You're still grounded, but I'm just telling you, the honest part of it, there's a part of that that wasn't good in there, and I, I was wrong. Or to come up to our kids at some point and say, you know what, I, I really wasn't listening. You were trying to tell me something, and I didn't think it was very important because I'm trying to get the big scheme and big picture of everything, and I really wasn't listening to you, and I want to tell you something I was wrong for kind of blowing you off. Or son, daughter, I, I didn't lead our family well in this situation. 
and my inactivity, my kind of checking out of the situation made everything worse for everybody. And I want you to know, I need to take responsibility for that. That's, that's on me. Man, what would happen if our kids start to hear us just honestly confess our sins? I wonder when this story, when you talk about the Passover, how the story would be told when God says, when your kids ask why you do this, tell them. I think it could go one of two ways. You could have someone, an Israelite parent, say, okay, son, daughter, I'll tell you why we do this. We do this Passover meal because we were a people enslaved in Egypt, and the Egyptians were horrible. They beat us, they enslaved us, they actually tried to commit genocide against us by taking our newborns and tossing them into the Nile River. These were evil people. And God, who is a righteous and just God, saw it all, and he saw our misery, and God in his goodness came down, and he wanted to rescue us, and he brought plagues against them in judgment. And finally, on this night, he brought the plague of the killing of the firstborn son. And the firstborn son means the hopes of the whole family, the responsibility of the whole family, and God was holding them responsible. And on that night, God got the bad guys, and he saved us the good guys. I could see that story being told, but I could also see an honest parent who says to his child, I'll tell you why this happened. They were evil. They did horrible things to us. They wanted to wipe us out. And on that night, God brought judgment. But did you notice, son? Did you notice, daughter, that we had to kill our very best lamb? An innocent lamb had nothing to do with this, but we had to slaughter that lamb. And we had to take the blood of that lamb and put it over our doorposts. And that it actually tells us, God tells us that he spared us. Why would he have to spare us if we were the good guys? He spared us because, I got to tell you, son, daughter, we deserve death too because we're sinners. You deserve death? You're saying that you're a sinner like the Egyptians are sinners? I'm not trying to minimize what they did. I'm trying to say that I am a sinner and I deserve death. And God in his mercy gave us a way to be saved. He said, if you put the blood up, but notice, son and daughter, did you know that we couldn't leave the house after we did that? Wouldn't it have been a great sign for us to walk out among the streets while the angel of death is killing all the bad guys and to say, look, we're safe. But God says, you're only safe if you're under the blood. And to say, we have to stay in this house. We're saved by grace and mercy, not because we are the good guys, but because God is a God who's gracious and willing to cover our sin if we stop trying to make ourselves look good and trust in his righteousness and tell them that story. Then suddenly, children begin to see, oh, this isn't about bad guys, good guys. This is about we're all sinners. And mom and dad too. So this, what this means to you is what? I needed the lamb. In fact, let me tell you a story, son or daughter. Let me tell you a story about the lamb. Because our goal as a parent is then what? To point them to the true lamb of God. To say this is not just a bunch of stories from a long time ago. This is about the living God now. And I want to tell you a story I'm glad you keep asking why. Here's the story about the lamb. That lamb goes back a long way. Did you know when Adam and Eve first died or first committed a sin and they were told they were going to have to die and yet they tried to cover themselves in fig leaves but God actually gave them animal coverings which means an animal had to die in their place, a substitute. That animal's blood for theirs. Did you know that later on there was a guy named Abraham who had a son whom he loved. And God told him to take his son up to the mountain that he would show him. And by the way, son, we celebrate this Passover in Jerusalem, but guess where that mountain was that Abraham took his son? It's where Jerusalem would end up being. And he told us, sacrifice your son. And on the way up, he gave his son the wood to carry for the sacrifice while Abraham carried the knife And all the way up, the son kept asking, but where's the animal for the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide. 
And when they got up there, instead of sacrificing his son, God provided a ram that was caught in the thicket, and that ram became the substitute death for him. And more than that, hundreds of years later, there was a prophet named Isaiah who said, and we're all like sheep, like lambs who've gone astray. But as Gary read earlier, but now there's come someone, the suffering servant, who takes on our sin and punishment. And then even later, there's a man named John. When he saw Jesus, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mom, Dad, why do we have to go to church? Do we have to go to church? Why do we go to church? You could give the quick answer. Hey, Google this. It's Sunday. That's why we go. We go to church because it's Sunday. Quit asking. You know we always go. Just get in the car. We're going to church. You could say, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about that because it means something to me. And that story is this true Lamb of God. He died for me. We go because we have a good, good father. And he did like Abraham. He walked his son up a hill. He made his son carry the wooden cross. And when that angel, when Abraham went to sacrifice his son, but he, he didn't at the end because God said, no, don't do it, I've provided for you. And the angel said, well, now I know that you love God. Why? Because you didn't even spare your only son. You were willing to sacrifice your only son. Now we get to tell God, our Heavenly Father, that very thing. Oh, we know. No. I know. I know that you love me because you did not spare your only son. Son, daughter, we don't have to go to church. We get to go to church. Son, daughter, we don't have to serve. We don't have to try to impress God or earn something from Him. We get to serve because He loved us first. And this is personal. And I needed His sacrifice. I'm lost without it. And to hear our mothers and our fathers and our grandparents telling our children, I'm a sinner. And without that sacrifice, I'm lost. But I'll tell you, when you receive it, it changes everything from the inside out. And son, daughter, that's all we've ever prayed for you, is that you would come to know the true Lamb of God. Let's pray.